Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Catherine Min. I am an assistant professor here at UNCA, and I'd like to welcome you. Uh, tonight's presentation is a joint um, uh, effort from both the department and the Lit Club. And so Madison Oli is going to um, also welcome you. Hi, my name is Madison Ollie, and I'm the president of the Lit Club, and we have refurbished and restarted the Lit Club this year. So we have a lot of new exciting things going on, such as this event, and we also have our meetings every Thursday in Carpen 234, and anyone can join. You don't have to like Lit even, you can just come and have fun. <laughs> <laughs> So we have a lot of fun events going on, and this Thursday is actually Childhood Book Day, so you don't have to bring a childhood book, but if you just want to talk about something and how your experience has changed, obviously, through reading and everything like that. And we're also going to be finalizing the roster, so hurry up and join, everybody. So thank you for coming out today. Hello. Joseph Bethanti is the Poet Laureate of North Carolina. He is the author of seven books of poetry, most recently Sonnets of the Cross. A new collection of poems, Concertina, is forthcoming from Mercer University Press. His novel, East Liberty, won the 2001 Carolina Novel Award. His latest novel, Coventry, won the 2006 Novello Literary Award. His book of stories, The High Heart, won the 2006 Spokane Prize. His collection of personal essays, Half of What I Say is Meaningless, winner of the 2012 Will D. Campbell Award for Creative Nonfiction, is forthcoming from Mercer University Press. He is the recipient of literature fellowships from the North Carolina Arts Council in 1994 for poetry and 2009 for fiction. The Samuel Talmadge Reagan Award, presented annually for outstanding contributions to the fine arts of North Carolina over an extended period, the Linda Flowers Prize, the Sherwood Anderson Award, the Barbara Mandigo Kelly Peace Poetry Prize, and many others. He was named the Gilbert Chapel Distinguished Poet for the Re Western Region for the North Carolina Poetry Society for 2011 and 12. Bethanti is a professor of creative writing and writer in residence of Watauga Global Community at Appalachian State University. I remember reading Joseph Bethanti's first novel, East Liberty, in secret mostly at night and with a flashlight after I'd been sent to bed. I was nine years old and my parents deemed Bethanti's coming of age tale a little too provocative for me. <laughs> a year or two later, when I was officially given the green light to read it, I finally got the opportunity to ask the author a question I'd had for some time by then. Hey dad, is there gonna be a sequel? <laughs> it's my great honor to introduce my father, North Carolina Poet Laureate, Joseph Bethanti. Thank you, Beckett. You can all go home now. You know? <laughs> well, that's um, the best introduction I've ever had and the best introducer. So what an honor to be here, too, at UNCA. I'm so glad to be here. I've been in this room a couple times talking about Black Mountain College. And everything you do here at UNCA is a, just a credit to the system, the North Carolina University system. You are designated the liberal arts university, and God bless the liberal arts, and keep them coming, UNCA. The first poem I'm going to read um, is called is called Drought, um, and it's no accident that I'm reading it. It's it's dedicated to Beckett. Um, it's a baseball poem too, so it's timely that it, that that I read it because we're moving into that we're moving into that wonderful time. Um, Beckett was uh, a fanatic baseball player when he was little, um, and I was too. And so we we just spent hours playing ball um, in the backyard. You know, he was he was really little too. Um, so one time, I think he was about six years old, he was having a, a batting slump. And he knew what those were. Um, 
And so Joan, my wife, who is, is seated next to Beckett, was, was cooking something, making something from a, I don't know, a cookbook. In, in the open cookbook showed Babe Ruth um, with instead of two Louisville sluggers over his left shoulder, he had scallions, okay? <laughs> And that was because, apparently, and this might be simply apocryphal, that when Babe Ruth was in a batting slump, he used to eat scallions to come out of it. So Beckett, a young reader, uh, saw the graphic and then read the story and decided that he was going to start eating onions to cure his batting slump. But he, but he hated, hated onions, of course. He's six years old. Which, raw onions, if you can imagine a six-year-old eating them. Um, and, and the poem also is, gets a little allegorical, but, but it's mainly about baseball and my son. But it's also set during a precarious time in the summer. We were living in Iredale County when there was one of those disastrous droughts where water was being rationed. And, you know, the corn was beginning to just die and drought. A batting slump leaguers my six-year-old, balls from his bat which rung off our tin roof, nest in the brown withered June grass, wild onions, the only tenuous green between the sun and the water table, 16 inches to the bat and falling, scarecrow farmers maundering among clicking kernels of dead wheat. Strike after futile strike, he implores I pitch when it is obvious it will have to come back on its own. Like Elias, summoning rain, he flails the 27-inch silver Adirondack like a Roth prophet's sword until he can no longer lift his arms, parsing through the neurotic ticks of the hexed hitter, adjusting his stance, swapping bats, crossing himself, pawing with his bare toes at the cracked earth. Long past dusk, the ball graying in the falling night after I have gone in to draw his ration bath, he drills, fearful that hitting like God is simply random, one day a blessing, the next a curse. From an open cookbook, he learns Babe Ruth ate scallions to cure slumps. There's a caricature of the Bambino in pinstripes swinging a giant scallion in the on-deck circle. I explain their onions, which he abhors from the Lily family, that the Egyptians believed they symbolized the world. His first bite leaves him paralyzed, catatonic, the dusty face beneath the hat bill suddenly old and drained. Each meal he eats them, tears washing his cheeks as he gnashes, then out to the yard, still no rain, the waxing moon so bright it is a sound lording above the grizzled ground off which he grazes like a baby satyr on wild onions. The night of the solstice, I hear from my bed the telltale thunder of a ball launched off a bat an instant before rain pellets down on the roof, then the relentless whoosh as water resounds in endless ovation. Slowly, the land upon which my cured son stands opens so very, very slowly to the sky at last, its sealed lips. So while I'm on the, the subject of kids, I'm going to read a, a poem called Peaches, which features both of my sons. When they were little, when we were living in Iredale County, my wife, Joan's family's from Atlanta, so we would take this back route down to Atlanta, and we would always go through Gaffney, and my two sons always had to go to the bathroom at exactly the moment we got to this particularly raunchy roadhouse where we would always stop. And, and you know, it's said that, that we do become our parents um, as we get older, and, and I was never more my parents than when I would take my boys into this syphilitic sump of a roadhouse and um, caution them against all the diseases they would get if they weren't really careful. This is simply called Peaches. On a roadhouse bathroom wall, 
In the peach town of Gaffney, South Carolina, a woman's body laminates itself across the face of a condom machine. Her legs spread to accommodate the notched silver knob one turns after fitting four bits in the slot. Not quite naked, her lips pout crimson, long, dark hair obscuring breasts that sink slowly into a loose black camisole, hands writhing in a cat's cradle at her G-string. They come in a full spectrum of color, classic French tickler, lubricated, extra strength, ultra thin, reservoir tip, vibra ribbed, the pleasure ring. Don't look at that, I command my transfixed sons. <laughs> and they turn away the very instant they would have been struck to salt or blinded. The three of us use the lone toilet, cigarettes floating in the yellow brine, the boys mugging at the smell aim for the butts. Don't touch a thing, I bark, lifting my boot to the flush handle. Then we soap and wash and wash again, the goddess of hygiene staring down upon us as they towel their hands on my jeans. <laughs> Back on the road, peach trees come at us from all sides, somehow cruel in winter, sharpened like tenter hooks, clawing at the dripping horizon. In the center of the vast orchards, rising monolithic on its four-story golf tee, sprouts a water tower designed as a giant peach, roseate, Luscious and long, its flange suggesting perfectly the buttocks of a voluptuous woman bent slightly forward. What is a condom? asks my older son. For birth control, I answer. He makes a guttural sound, signaling his disgust. Yet boys come to condoms in startlingly original ways. I find myself looking at my wife, gazing out the passenger window at the scrum of trees, waiting for spring to bear on their naked twigs pink flowers. I grew up in Pittsburgh, and, and Pittsburgh's in the southwest corner of Pennsylvania. And right next to, to Pennsylvania is West Virginia. When I was growing up, the legal drinking age in Pennsylvania was 21 and in West Virginia, 18. I probably don't have to say too much more. <laughs> um, and so this poem is about the speaker who we can loosely identify with me, I suppose, um, taking a girl across the state line in a borrowed car. Wheeling, driving a girl whose father loathed me, son of an Italian who labored on the open hearth, I crossed in a borrowed green comment the PA line into Wheeling. 18 was legal in West Virginia, Marlboro's and 3-2 beer at the hilltop on a street with whorehouses and a Jesuit college. She was 16, a minor, the true miner secreted in black, sulfurous pockets, whispering beneath the tavern floor we sat upon. The jukebox was loud and country. It was easy to ignore the charge being laced under us. My girl was drunk and singing along. Loretta Lynn, Tammy Wynette, though she didn't know the words, the way folks mouth like speaking in tongues when the spirit lays hold of them. The smudge on her cheek, secondhand coat, her blonde hair shone white in that light aged into a coal miner's wife or steel workers like my mother. When the 4 to 12 shift from Wheeling, Pittsburgh dragged in, I smelled asbestos and baked ore, the vaporous green sizzle of my father's work fatigues. I wanted to tell her all about her father. I'd rip him to pieces, that bastard. My dad was a brave man. He climbed boom cranes with nothing but a span of leather fastening him above the smokestack, streaming 12 stories of fire into the firmament. But I had no vocabulary to render his mythic toil. I knew more about her dad, his suits and office in downtown Pittsburgh, his perfect diction in college education. We hung around till last call, then kissed against the fender until the lot emptied and the hilltop's neon shingle sputtered out the comet wouldn't start. I turned it over and over until I killed the battery, till I couldn't get a peep 
out of the horn for the lights to flicker. The mighty Ohio beat by, whelped in Pittsburgh, it loops north in defiance of gravity, abruptly slices west, southering into the fang of northern West Virginia, then impales the border of Ohio in Pennsylvania like the long, jagged neck of a busted bottle. That's where we stood clinging to each other, stranded along the omniscient river where I still like to think of us before those miners, like escaped purgatorians, burst black and smoldering through the bottom of our lives. And she started to cry, anticipating her father's patrician wrath. I thought of who I could call, knowing there was only one man on earth who would rise out of his exhausted sleep at the sound of my voice like Lazarus and come running. So I call my dad. <laughs> so I want to read a poem now um, about my dad, who was a steel worker for 47 years in the first, the first steel mill that Andrew Carnegie opened um, in America. And um, my dad was a, a quiet, humble, gentle, working man um, who came home from work never talked about work, but just kind of went about his business. Um, you know, the perfect father for a kid like me. Um, and I remained pretty much ignorant of what he did for a living. I knew he was a steel worker in a steel mill, but I didn't really know what that was at all. Um, nor did my sister. Um, and my mother was of the same temperament. She was a seamstress. She worked in a men's tailor shop in downtown Pittsburgh um, in a row of sewing machines behind another row of sewing machines behind another row of sewing machines. And both my mom and dad were first generation in this country. All my grandparents um, immigrated from three from Italy, one from France in the early part of um, the 20th century. So they shielded us from all of that, and they dreamt dreams for us until we could dream them uh, for ourselves. And, and you know, they're why I'm standing here in my white shirt in front of you, um, in that what I do for a living is not dangerous, like what they did for a living. Um, so the poem is about seeing my dad's mill for the first time. And I only saw it because I needed the car, so I dropped him off. We had one car. People only had one car. If they had a car, it was a 1963 Chevy Bel Air. It was quite a boat. Um, so I dropped him off so I could keep the car for the rest of the day to go to my senior after prom picnic. And the name of the poem is called Knocked, but it's not like knocking on a door. It's that saying that I would hear men use that he's got it knocked like he's got it made. Knocked. I was 17 before I saw Edgar Thompson, the steel mill, where my father had worked since he was 17, and only then because I needed his car for the senior after prom picnic. The theme was color my world. Sleepless, having danced all night, a furnace of cheap champagne and still in my tuxedo, I dropped him off at 7 a.m. in Braddock, named for a revolutionary war general, Three bars in every block, street lights turned on the afternoon so the school kids could see their ways home through the ore dust. The mill was blue and corrugated, rising in shaft after shaft of smoke that sawtooth into gray sky. I never saw its top. The men in the boom crane cabs wore hard hats and drank coffee. They had it knocked, my father said, but not him. He had to climb the backs of those monsters. When I was little, insisted I wanted to be like him and work in the mill. He'd snap, no, you're not. You're going to college. In a few months, I really would be going to college. Working in a steel mill was the last thing I wanted to do. My father eased out of the car, handed me a 20, told me to be careful, pinned on his millwright's badge and filed into the smoke with the others. I turned up the radio dropped the engine into low for torque and floored it, sure that in one night I had had more fun, more love, more everything 
than he had had in his life, and I wanted to get back to it as fast as I could. I want to thank Rick Chess for inviting me. I just sat in on his class, and Holly sat in with it, and all of his all-star students are peppered throughout the audience. Um, it was really a, a terrific experience. Uh, I thought I'd read a basketball poem since, uh, I don't know, I heard it was basketball season. You know. <laughs> and I do see North Carolina as, you know, the, when I came here in 1976, I got the picture pretty quick that this was the basketball state. You know, I, I'm from Pittsburgh, and it, you know, it's a football town um, in, in baseball. Basketball, yes, but not, not with the pathology of North Carolina, which, which, <laughs> which I really respect, you know. I mean, I come from a town where, you know, like that kind of stuff is religion, and people fight and throw themselves off of bridges over it. So I, I really appreciate that. The um, name of this poem is called Jojo. Um, and it's about a, 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 a friend of mine that I went to high school with. I went to a, an all boys Catholic high school, 1600 boys, um, that my mother referred to as a private school for Catholic hoodlums. Um, <laughs> so it was very competitive. And, and this fellow, Joe Costanzo, was the good basketball player. Um, and, and he is still living off the fumes of being a great high school athlete. Um, and I don't see anything wrong with that in a lot of ways, you know. Um, so all you really need to know about this poem is that in it, there's a kind of a pivotal moment where somebody in the stands does an imitation of the coach's voice, which I think is also universal to mimic your teachers and coaches, and if you're not doing that, you should start instantly. <laughs> it's late, late in the game. We're playing Canavan in our gym, a bandbox so small the people sitting on the bottom bleachers squat to keep their feet off the inbounds. Less than 20 seconds and Central's down one. Joe Costanzo's bringing the ball up. Coach Killian's on his feet. Every kid in the school can do an imitation of his voice. Jojo loves having the ball, can't keep his hands off it really, and the outside shot is his trope, a kind of two-hand knock-knee jumper, but he never actually gets off the floor the ball with a lot of arc, leaving his hands which twist counterclockwise, giving it a reverse English as it snaps through the hoop, the net cracking like a stick then turns itself inside out and the ref has to get it back down by throwing the ball up through the underside of the rim. Joe shoots a lot, more than he has to, but he can score. On a good night, he hardly misses. He'll throw in 40, 50. He's captain, all Catholic, all Western PA, totally conscious of every move he makes. He's invented himself and pulled it off. You can see it when the team comes out to warm up the way he Swoops in for his layups, his sweet Georgia Brown blares over the PA and Central's tiny gym begins to rock. Joe's a sweet guy, no denying. Number 44 in your program, number one in your heart, he signs everyone's yearbook. <laughs> the clock shows 15 seconds. There's time to work it in to one of the big guys for something close, draw the foul. Two from the line, at least one and one, tie it up, overtime, play the percentages. Canavan's working a half-court man press, so they pick up at center court. JoJo right in the middle of the jump circle, dribbling, the clock dwindling. When Russ Benko, one of Joe's boyhood friends from St. Rosalia's in Greenfield, everyone's standing now, banging the bleachers with their heels, the whole gym literally vibrating, the walls sweating. Russ yells in his best Mr. Killian imitation, there's nobody better at it. You'd think it was him, his wife would think it was him. Russ yells, shoot it, JoJo, shoot it. And JoJo, at dead half court, with a guy all over him, never hesitates. Just throws it up with that quirky twist way up, the ball seeming to spin in six different directions. Killian can't believe it. Bending over, and beating his thighs with his fists, squeezing his head between his hands. He's going to kill JoJo, a cockeyed half-court jumper with a man wide open under the boards. Jesus, that goes in without touching the rim, as if there were no rim. 
just an invisible hole in the air that only Jojo and the ball know about, the net there simply to swoon like lace on its halo of orange steel. It's a true story. <laughs> it really is a true story. I'm going to read. Um, we, we were talking in, in Rick's class with Holly and all of us and the students just about moving around from genre to genre. So I'm going to read a real, real short story. Um, you know, that could be a poem, and probably is, but um, here it's a piece of fiction. It's called Driving, and it's, it's um, narrated. I have this book called The High Heart. It, it's 14 linked stories where the same guy named Fritz Sweeney, he narrates it. He um, is growing up in Pittsburgh, imagine that. And um, his mom is a really splenetic Italian, and his dad is a very mellow Irishman. Driving. When I turned 16, my mother insisted I learn how to operate an automobile. My father didn't drive something my mother held against him just as she did the fact that he did all the cooking and was addicted to the newspaper and made predictions often dead center about which way the world in 1971 would lurch. A man had to drive a car. One morning she woke me at 3 a.m. after she and my father blew in from their restaurant jobs. Illuminated by the pale light from the hall behind her, she hovered over my bed like a giant moth arms spread cruciform in the mammoth sleeves of her short, furry leopard jacket, its spots invisible in the murk, her head voluminous, webbed in high teased hair through which cracks of light leaked. I smelled liquor, lipstick, and hairspray, the latent rank and cloy of eight hours on her feet, followed by a string of nightcaps with my dad and some friends after he clocked out from waiting tables just up the street. Get dressed, you're learning how to drive, she commanded. My dad stood out in the hall under the light bulb. He had already had his say on this subject. My mother had paid no attention. I could see this by the way he undid his bow tie, then his shirt, going down those buttons, like he was playing the last sad notes on a sax, last call, no one around to listen. God, Rita, he said, let the boy sleep. He's learning to drive, she pronounced. He's not going to grow up to be helpless like you. <laughs> she closed my door behind her, then badgered me into my clothes from the other side of it while she and my dad sniped at each other. He was a gutless wonder. She was a princess. He could kiss her ass. He admired her ass, especially the way she substituted it for brains. <laughs> Dressed. I opened the door, and there they were. My mother on tiptoe, those big calf muscles bulging under the sheen of her high, white, patent leather zippered go-go's, arms up around my dad's neck. His hands on her hips, shirt unbuttoned, an unknotted maroon bow tie still dangling from his neck like the confessor's stole. Her leopard lay crouched on the floor, short, lacy, black dress, flimsy from the waist up. Then, as if on cue, like they had rehearsed, they stopped kissing and wheeled on me. Get your ass in the car, my mother said, and peeled off my father. I'm teaching you to drive. Rita, you couldn't teach a man on fire to jump in a swimming pool, snapped my dad. <laughs> then I'll die trying, she fired back at him, then winked at me. My dad laughed and said very plainly, large mistake, then disappeared into their bedroom across the hall. My mother sped down Negley Run Boulevard with her left arm out the window. With her right hand, she clutched the steering wheel in a lit Chesterfield. Just before we hit Washington Boulevard, she slowed to a crawl and bumped the car over the curb into a massive grassy field at the edge of the three-story tower used to teach firemen how to jump out of burning buildings. The tower was bathed in spotlights, and beneath it was a huge net. Firemen decked in full turnout plunged off the edge of the tower, one after another, 
but we couldn't see them land because of the trees in the foreground. Why are they doing that in the middle of the night? I wondered out loud. This is when most fires start, my mother answered, then doused the headlights and switched off the ignition. Get behind the wheel. Our car was a used beige 61 Chevy Impala with a three-speed on the column. I didn't know what an Impala was. I'm sure my mother didn't either. In the nearly full moon, the keys and the chrome in the car's interior pulsed smokily like extinguished neon. My mother demonstrated how the car started, the flick of the key in the ignition, how just the slightest pressure on the throttle was enough, often more than enough, to hurl you into the future. But as long as you had the clutch and the brake clamped hard against the floor, nothing bad could happen. She ordered me to engage the clutch, then with her hand on mine, she guided me through the gears in their intricate relationship with speed and regret. Delicate was the word she used in the moonlight, smoking a cigarette while a stream of men flew off the tower. Then she whispered suddenly, Fritzy, I'm finished, and dropped her cigarette out the window. She couldn't go on a moment more. If I ever wanted to see home again, then I had to drive us there myself. Did I understand? Things are that desperate, she said, but everything, every little thing, Fritzy, will be fixed, put back together, I promise, if you'll drive me home. I want to go home now. Then she began to cry, an indulgence she never permitted herself. Mom, I don't know how to drive. I don't even have a learner's permit. You can drive, Fritz. I just taught you. You are going to be a man, not like your father and take me home, then everything, god damn it, will be fine. Crying so hard she could barely get her breath, gagging out the words. I fired up the car, patted in the clutch, dropped the stick into the lower left leg of the mysterious H of the gearbox, transferred my right foot from brake to throttle and caressed the gas. I eased up on the clutch and clearly felt it, that in-betweenness my mother had described the just before that's always better than what's about to happen. I slid my shoe off the clutch and hit the gas. With a ravenous hiss, the impala lifted off the earth. And I'll read one more tinier story from this, actually. It's the concluding story, and in, in, in they're not in chronological order in terms of he's five, he's six, he's seven. This is called Atavia, and Atavia is a, is a, a, a homemade Italian liqueur, very strong, and it's red, and it's viscous, and it's very intoxicating. And it's narrated by the same fellow, Fritz Sweeney. I stand in the middle of our shrunken yard holding the hose nozzle geared to spray straight up at the sky. The water falls back down over me in a gentle rain, silvered by the late afternoon sun that hunkers in the firmament like the flaming entry to the other side. A few feet away, my parents sit on stained green and white striped lawn chairs. As I peer through the sleeve of mist enveloping me, they lapse in and out of focus. On the tiny rusted table between them are a radio cigarettes and a bottle of liqueur called Atavia. It is the color of merthiolate and possesses the same terrifying smell. My mother wants a baby, but she cannot conceive because someone has put the eyes on her. She consulted with Graziel, the neighborhood strega. Graziella makes the Atavia, which means, according to my mother, to your life. She handed my mother the bottle with the instructions that she and her amatore, my father, each drink one cordial glass of it before retiring every night until the bottle is spent. Graziel was explicit and grave, wagging a long, flimsy finger in my mother's face, and do not forget, pray to God, entrust to nature, appassionato. But my parents don't drink with that kind of res restraint. They quickly forget about Graziel's formula for the Bambino. They'll drain the entire bottle this burning afternoon, and then there will be too much amore. 
My mother tilts her head and closes her eyes. Mascara mats like dust in her lashes. She wears a black bathing suit top, a flimsier version of her black brassieres, and a pair of too tight red shorts that crimp her rubbery midriff. Violet veins scrag up and down her thick legs, lacquered red toenails. My father, bare-chested, his belly crayon white, his shoulders hot pink from the sun, wears bedroom slippers and khakis. On his left arm is a tattooed heart, Rita, my mother's name. It rips through it, then an arrow. He holds both her hands as they kiss. When they come away from each other, she seems almost shy, self-conscious. She looks at me and smiles, but I make no sign that I've noticed. They drink from shot glasses stenciled with monkeys hanging by their tails from a tree branch, bottoms up, scrawled beneath the monkeys. The radio is turned to Whammo, Pittsburgh's black station. Porky Chedwick, the Whammo DJ, your platter pushing papa, announces that it's 98 degrees. All afternoon, he spun 45s like heat waves, summer in the city, hot fun in the summertime. Between songs, Porky plays the Whammo jingle. What do you know? You know WMO. My mother points toward a lone patch of fleecy clouds and says, those clouds look like a man and woman about to explode. When the long, hot summer pours out of the radio, they rise and dance. My mother rests her head on my father's shoulder, wraps both hands around his neck. Her mouth moves to the song. His chin rests on her head, an inch of cigarette smoldering between his lips. Eyes closed, he sweats heavily. They drag across the parched yard. The grass, what's left of it, has gone to clover, long stalks topped with brown shriveled buds swarming with bees. Bees light on my mother's bare feet, my father's slippers, bees along the rims of their shot glasses, along the bottleneck as well. Bees climb their legs and roost in their hair. They sit on my father's closed eyelids, on my mother's lips as she soundlessly sings. I can see that Graziella's potion has taken hold. There's sure to be a baby now. <laughs> so. Okay, I'm just checking the time. We're doing okay on time, aren't we? I mean, you wouldn't tell me. You wouldn't say, no, no, it's time. <laughs> Sit down. Enough. You know, I'm going to read. I, I, Beckett mentioned I have a, um, a new book of poems coming out in the fall. It's um, they're prison poems. I, I worked. Um, I came to North Carolina in '76 as a Vista volunteer and worked in the prison system. And m my wife Joan and I, we both met at training, as a matter of fact. So we spent a lot of time just just working there um, among inmates. And I continue to go in there and do do creative writing workshops in various prisons. In fact, a few weeks ago, I was at Fountain Correctional Center for Women um, in, in Nash County. So I wanted to read a poem called uh, Women in Prison. Uh, we had this orientation, Joan and I, and the rest of the Vistas in our group when we came. They took us to Central Prison in Polk Youth Center and then they took us to women's prison. And, and this was 1976. Um, my, my culture had not prepared me at that point. I was 23 for women in prison, if you will. Um, the culture had just given me models of men in prison. I, I had visual images in my head. So the first time I walked on a yard, women's prison, the big prison in Raleigh, I was, I was shocked and filled with sorrow because um, there were these blameless looking women just ambling about in these blue prison shifts, if you will. And they just seemed to me anything but criminals. They looked like my grandmother and my mother and my aunts, etc. But the other thing that happens when women go to prison, of course, is that they often, most of the time, leave children behind. So we worked for, with an ex-offenders uh, organization called ECHO ex-convicts organization. Ex-convicts, you'll be happy to know, are now ex-offenders. Um, 
And what we would do every twice, twice a month on Sundays, we would take kids to Central, um, to women's prison to see their moms. So this is just called women's prison. Two Sundays a month, darkness still abroad. We round up the kids and bundle them into a restored, salvaged bluebird school bus, repainted green, and make the long haul to Raleigh where their mothers are locked in women's prison. We pin the children's names and numbers to their coats, count them like convicts at lights out, sucking thumbs, clutching favorite oddments to cuddle as they ride, curled in twos on patched, sprung benches. They sleepwalk bashfully, the little aged, into the belly of the bus, eyes nailed to the floor. We feed them milk and juice, animal crackers, apples, stop for them to use the bathroom and to change the ones so young they can't help wetting. We try singing folk tunes and strike ballads as if off to picket or march with an army of babies, but their stony faces will not yield, and finally their passion to disappear puts them to sleep, not to wake until the old bluebird jostles through the checkpoints into the prison. Somehow, upon reopening their eyes, they know to smile at the twirling, jagged grandeur surrounding the massive compound, concertina, clotted with silver scraps of dew and dawn light, a bullet-torn shroud of excelsior scored in dismal fire, levitating in the savage Sabbath sky. By then, their mothers, in the last moments of girlish, raw-boned glory, appear in baggy, sky-blue prison shifts, their beautiful hands lifting to shield their eyes like saints about to be slaughtered. As if the light is too much, the sky suddenly egg-blue, plaintive, threatening to pale away, the sun still invisible yet blinded, barefoot, weepy. They call their babies by name and secret endearment, touch them everywhere like one might the awakened dead. The children remain dignified, nearly aloof in their perfect innocence and self-possession, toddling dutifully into the arms of anyone who reaches for them, even the guards petting them too. When visiting hours conclude, the children hand their mothers cards and drawings, remnants of a life they are too young to remember, but conjure in glyphic crayon blazes. Attempting to recollect the narrative that will guide them back to their imagined homes, the mothers peer from the pictures to the departing children, back and forth, straining to make the connection, back and forth, until the children, already fast asleep, as the bus spirits them off disappear. And I'll read a poem, too, called uh, The Dogs at Salisbury. When, when Joan and I arrived in North Carolina in 1976, the prison system still had one foot firmly planted in the old chain gang, and the other foot was trying to move towards a model away from custody into treatment. Um, but, but we had the hostage crisis and Jimmy Carter unfortunately left the White House and we moved right back into that, we're not gonna take it anymore. Um, that kind of three strikes you're out, lock them up and throw away the key and we incarcerate three million people in this country more than any country on earth, as a matter of fact. Um, and you know, these statistics make of them what you will, but it's been said that up to perhaps 70% of the people doing time in this country are doing it for, for drug-related charges. Anyhow, um, they actually had bloodhounds, and they might still have them now. So if a man escaped, um, they would go out with them after bloodhounds, and they had a, a bounty hunter whose name was Luther, who rode horseback, and they also had something called dog boys, which is, strikes me as the equivalent of a trustee, although the North Carolina system doesn't have trustees. But the dog boys were the people that kind of trained the dogs, and they would actually go out after the escape with the dogs to try and corral who, who, whoever, whoever was escaped. And they kept the dogs penned in uh, the Salisbury unit in Rowan County along the left field line of the softball field where where we used to, you know, I used to play softball with the inmates. The dogs at Salisbury. 
The bloodhounds were caged in a skirmish of wire lots, the same wire that penned the convicts along the left field line of the Salisbury camp softball field in Rowan County. Doped and clumsy, the dogs paced their tiny allotments waiting to be strung on the trail of some wayfaring booster turned rabbit. The penitentiary contracted an old fire-faced man named Luther to run down escapes they couldn't call her once into deep country. Bounty hunters, what he amounted to, went horseback, convicts, Stetson hat, khaki, work fatigues, cartridge belt and pistol, an awful throwback man and no believer. A band of lifers, dog boys so-called, strange and beholden to Luther, touched from too long in jail, ran on all fours if need be with them on the track of an escape. They babied those dogs like lovers, loosed them on long chains and swabbed their faces with the ratty, tattered gray bunk clothes their prey had slipped out of just before dawn shift change among the guards. Luther, cantered up on a sorrel gelding, rolled a tailor made from a can of stud, sat there in a scud of smoke, then wordlessly led them out. It had a stylized, filmic tint to it, but stripped of movie stars and allegory, just shackle in Leviticus, the infernal antebellum geography, impenetrable, wet, burning green. Luther, his catamites, and a pack of chain gang bloodhounds, their obscene shimmy and piss, the slavering coiled bray, Jesus dragging his tree through swamp and nightshade. I'll read three more poems, and then, and then I'm glad to take, to take questions. I'm going to read from a book of poems I just had come out. They're called um, Sonnets of the Cross, and they're actually they're, they're Elizabethan sonnets based on the 14 Stations of the Cross. And the 14 Stations of the Cross commemorate um, the last hours of Jesus' life um, as he made his way to Golgotha to be crucified. Um, and in, in the early centuries, the first and second and third centuries, Pilgrims would go to the Holy Land and actually walk the way of the cross, and that's how the stations came to be. And they tend to be mounted in, in beautiful reliefs and free, friezes and art works around the nave of the church so that people go around. The nave of Catholic churches, but I know um, Protestant churches too, so they, can, you know, you could go around the church and, and make devotions to, um, to them. And this is Lent, of course, this is Lent. Um, and and um, I've taken a lot of liberty with these, um, hopefully not with the spirituality involved, but they are unorthodox and iconoclastic, and Jesus is a, um, a working-class hero who ends up being the victim of the death penalty. Um, so... Um, They're set in Pittsburgh and North Carolina. So I, I want to read, um, I'll just read two. The first one is Jesus Carries His Cross, and it's actually a baseball poem. Because I've always conflated baseball and religion, I think, to tell you the truth. April. Baseball has finally begun. I fire a ball off a wall for glory, each catch an indulgence like a home run, whittling down my stretch in purgatory. A muff like sin fetches me more burning. Like everything else, baseball is God's game. Every spring is only sun dies yearning in the new green grass, not so much for fame, though like other sacrificials, Gehrig, Clemeni, Hausman's rookie boy athlete. He lives immortal in our dreams, wearing his resurrection flannels through the street, 33 stitched in blood on his jersey, playing for one more season of mercy. And then the next is Jesus falls the first time. Jesus falls three times during the stations, and this is the first one. And, and what I have here is Jesus taking his very first fall as a baby which is always tough on parents, you know. Then they fall a lot, and you see that they're going to get up, but that first fall, once they start walking, is, is just you're terrified that they're, that's the end of everything. So Jesus falls the first time. 
Um, the speaker is the Blessed Mother. He came late to walking, and I fretted, lest the blue yield of my virginity was flawed and marrow and sinew wetted by innocence whelping divinity. He could speak, but refused. He knew his name, knew Iscariot was his betrayer. The Psalter's archive, pretending his fame, had committed to memory Isaiah. His first toys were hammer, nails, adze, and all. His own apprentice bench, from which he pitched and split a cleft above his eye, a fall that would have killed another child. I stitched my pretty baby while he read a poem about bands of angels bearing him home. And then one more, and, and again, I'm glad to take, to take questions. Thanks for coming, by the way. So let me find this. I'm definitely reading this, so sit tight until I find it. <laughs> You know, the one thing about um, being experienced, here it is, I was going to say, is that when there are pauses, you know, you don't freak out or anything, you know, which is nice. And I'm going to end this poem, I mean this reading, and then take questions with this poem called um, Shooting Pool with Samuel Beckett. Hiding out in Boone Saloon shooting nine ball with my son, snubbing the querulous white page on my writing table. He lords the cue above the green felt parallelogram, six mysterious pockets. The balls configure elliptically, plane of syllables click as they touch, the sound unmistakable. Ruthlessly, he stabs fastidiously impatient as though running through his nemesis. He loves triumph and he's lucky. I still play to win but he gets better and better. And I see a day when he'll overtake me. Then for the rest of my life, it'll be a feat to best him. But for now, the sun shines through the long bar window and there's a warm breeze from the ceiling fan. Even the cigarette smoke strikes me as apropos this afternoon. So I buy a glass of beer, mount a high stool at the polished pine bar and watch my son, 13, named for Samuel Beckett, run the table. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for being such a great audience. Um, I'm glad, you know, I'm glad to take questions. Okay, I'm leaving. And if you don't have them, don't worry, truly. Yes, please. When you first came to North Carolina uh, in the mid-70s, were the tensions between North and South any greater, and did that have any influence on your work? Well, um, this is funny you should ask this, because um, when, I, when I met my wife um, from Georgia, Jones from Atlanta, um, Wow, she was kind of Yankee this and Yankee that. She really was. And, 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 and honestly, I was kind of ignorant of regional distinctions, to tell you the truth. I had never left the schoolyard in a lot of ways for 23 years. And the only Yankees I knew were kind of the New York Yankees, to tell you the truth. Um, so a lot of that was kind of lost on me. Um, but then the longer I was there, I, I think that that has decreased. You know, I mean, de decreased... Oh, exponentially, just I'm, I'm afraid it's because of the uh, incessant marauding and <laughs> infiltration that the North has done. I mean, gra gracious, isn't everybody delighted that there are bagels now in the South? You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean that was like the big gripe, uh, you know, of all the Yankees was like, we can't get good bread, you know, and, and, and everything's great now, we can get good bread, you know, but so... I love those regional distinctions too. I, I don't want the South, the South's pig-headedness, to disappear. And much in the same way as I wouldn't want my own native Italian ancestry, that kind of pig-headedness, to disappear. So, in one sense, we're always trying to assimilate, and 
I don't know, make peace, but, but, but I wish that we could, could still keep some of those borders without the, with, without the animosity, that's for sure. Um, but it, it has decreased appreciably, and, and I like to say that Pittsburgh's my beloved hometown, but North Carolina is my beloved home state. Um, and I, 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 I felt welcomed pretty instantly, you know. I mean, occasionally not, but that happens anywhere, you know. So it was a place congenial to my temperament and my heart, and, and, and I became a writer here. I don't know that I really would have, I don't know how that would have worked elsewhere. So, yes, ma'am. Comparing your uh, life to your father's life, you say, what I do is not dangerous. Do you believe that? I think what I say is dangerous and what I write is dangerous. There, the truth of the matter is, um, I honor men and women above all who have to put their their health and their bodies on the line for their job every day, you know. And, and we have those people out there and they're being squeezed so horribly now. Um, it is dangerous, it's risky to tell the truth in ways that I tell the truth, but I'm in front of people like you and what danger is there? I mean, for the most part, I get approval. Um, the biggest danger is probably to myself sometimes, I, I think. And, and if I start to get kind of political, that would be dangerous, and I think it is important to, to, to dig in these days. Um, but, but I think of my, you know, those working men and women who, who could get hurt, you know? I, I get paid, I'm a university pr professor. If I'm in the hall, I'm on the clock. I'm talking to one of my friends about like the Chapel Hill game. Or we're talking about Faulkner, or we're talking about Adrian Rich or Charles Olson. I'm getting paid. I go to the bathroom anytime I want. I'm, I'm, you know, I mean, I'm getting paid now. I mean, I'm thinking of those people that had to, um, you know, you punch in, you punch out, and somebody's always watching you, and you could get hurt. You could die, you know. And the other thing, the last job I had before coming to North Carolina as a VISTA volunteer, I was a hod carrier. So I, I, I worked on scaffolds with either 100 pounds of bricks or, or, or mortar on my back. And it was really hard work, and I was proud to do it. And I was 23, and I, I could do it. But I remember those guys who are 47, and I haven't been 47 for 12 years now, telling me, um, stay in school, man. You don't want to be doing this when you're my age. And what they meant was that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, and that, you know, I mean, imagine, you know, my dad would, he'd be hanging from a crane. It would be straight up minus 17. That's not even without the windshield. He'd be like six stories up with some tools trying to fix a crane, freezing. He's 63 years old, you know, I mean, wow. So that's what I mean. And it's real easy to forget those people. Politicians have forgotten them because we don't see them too much, you know, we just don't see them. And it's easy, too, to live in your bubble when you're in this blessed glory of the academic world, you know, which I like to tell my colleagues sometimes isn't coal mining, you know. So, although this is hard work, and it's really important, and it's never been more important, I don't think, to tell you the truth. So I'm sorry to get on that soapbox, but I mean like real physical danger, you know, where you could die or get hurt or break your leg or that kind of stuff. So, well, I do think what you do is great. Thank you, ma'am. I mean, I, that's a great compliment. I hope it is, you know. And if nothing else, we all as writers, and not just as writers, as everything, you know, carry that witness around of our forebears who, I don't know, who allowed us to, to be sitting here, you know. Well, your folks, you know, no matter what they do, you know. They dream for you, and then hopefully you dream. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, even considering, like, what you just said and the tension that's kind of in a lot of your poems, there's still a lot of, I mean, from what I've heard tonight, um, a lot of fun that's happening in there, and it's like playfulness. And I'm wondering, like, is it fun and playful when you're working on them? Like, or what's it like when you're working on yeah, them? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I talked, I talked in, in Rick's class. That was one of the last things that Holly and I talked about and um, all the students was that sometimes you're on these panels and you have to tell um, the audience how horrifying it is to write, you know. You know, you hear that, that you know, you open a vein, you know. 
you know, you really don't open a vein. You know, you have coffee and you're sitting in a warm place, you know? Um, in that writing is 90% inspiration and, I mean, 10% inspiration, 90% ins It is hard. It is hard, you guys. The failure rate is terrific. You fail all the time. Um, but I always, I always say that there should be joy in it. I mean, it's what I love to do, and when, if, I had, if and when I have time, I, I do it. It doesn't always go well. You know, but I mean, if you're playing ball, it's not always going well. You're booting grounders and you're striking out, but you still, you know, you still kind of love the game, I suppose. So it is fun. And, and, and I don't know, I feel like I've had a pretty happy life. And I, I, I had a great childhood, except for the nuns. <laughs> yeah, I really did. Yes, sir. Uh, in the same way that Babe Ruth eats Sky and said, you're out of his batting slumps, do you, um, I mean, unless you don't deal with it, do you, uh, is there like a certain thing you do or somewhere you go to deal with writer's block? You know, um, not to be a smarty pants, but I don't, I don't really have writer's block ever. And, and that's only because sometimes, well, sometimes I can't come up with anything new, but I have so much old that I need to go back, either revise and fin or, or, or finish. I was mentioning again in class how much fun it is to start stuff. You know, you're exhilarated, you're fired up. Wow, you finally hit the mother load. This is going to be your best poem, your best story. And then you stall and you put it down and you put it in, and you start something else. You know, we, you know, I, I, you know, everyone has these. You know, I got this little book filled with a million beginnings of fabulous poems. Will I, you know, will I get to all of them? I don't know. I aim to. So when I'm stuck, I always think, well, you know, there's that stack of things. So. There is that, you all, when you get, starting something new is the most fun, but if, if, if you get stuck and you start spinning your wheels with that, go, you know, move on to something else. Yes, sir. Can you explain the process of being selected poet laureate? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, I can. <laughs> um, you know, it's a nomination process that just go, that goes out to across the state, and any number of people are nominated. I think maybe 33 or 34 people were nominated. Um, you know, I know Holly was nominated this year, which is you know a great honor. I had been nominated before, so to be nominated is a fabulous honor. And Rick might have been nominated too. I mean, they're two of our best poets. Um, so then it, it, it starts to get, it starts to get whittled, it, you get whittled down, so to speak, and you, you, it, it finally came down. There's a panel chaired by uh, a, an important writer. It was Randall Keenan this year chaired my panel, um, and I can name some. It's no secret who was on it. It was just different poets and scholars and folks around the state, and they sift through it, and they come down to um, finalists and they make that, res that recommendation to the governor. I, I, I know that it came down to three people. And it's, it's funny because I got a call from somebody from the Department of Cultural Resources to kind of tell me it was down to three people. And that person said, have you ever written anything that might embarrass the governor? <laughs> and I said, no. You know. <laughs> Um, and, 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 it's, and that's basically, you know, it's basically it. The governor makes the call, but there's a recommendation apparently from the committee. So, you know, it's a pretty, I think it's a fairly democratic process. And I mean, what an honor to be chosen. I mean, it could have been any number of people, any number of people. It's really that kind of thing. There are any number of people that could be standing here. But, but, but it's a thrill to, that, it, that it's me. You know, maybe not for you. It's a thrill for me. <laughs> So, well, thanks so much. You're great. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you.